Hello, this is Michael Altos. We're continuing our discussion of neurophysiology. This is recording part four. The cerebral spinal fluid bathes the brain and the spinal cord and fills the ventricles. It serves to cushion the brain, which floats in the CSF. A normal adult has a CSF volume of about 150 milliliters. Your brain forms about 500 milliliters per day and it's formed from the choroid plexus, which is in the ventricles. The normal pressure of the CSF is about 5 to 15 millimeters of mercury in a supine patient. CSF pressure should reflect intracranial pressure. If CSF pressure is elevated, it could be because a tumor has decreased reabsorption we already saw that production far exceeds normal volume. So every day, you're creating a ton of CSF, and then it's getting reabsorbed in these arachnoid villi over here. If a tumor blocks that, you can have elevated CSF pressure. Or a hemorrhage could block reabsorption as well. These diagrams show some of the layers of the skull. We see skin, aponeurosis, periosteum, then the skull bone, then the dura, the arachnoid, and the pia, which is right up against the brain. CSF exists in the subarachnoid space between the arachnoid and the pia. Hydrocephalus is a condition where patients have excess cerebral spinal fluid. There are two kinds. Communicating hydrocephalus is where the fluid can easily flow throughout the system, but reabsorption is obstructed. Non-communicating hydrocephalus occurs when fluid is unable to flow out of the ventricles into the rest of the CSF space. The treatment of hydrocephalus is placement of a ventriculoperitoneal shunt, or a VP shunt. The shunt drains fluid from the ventricles through a thin tube, which ends in the peritoneal cavity. The fluid can then be reabsorbed in the peritoneal cavity. Most parts of the central nervous system are impermeable to plasma proteins and large molecules. This is called the blood-brain barrier. Some electrolytes are able to pass the blood-brain barrier, and gases and lipid-soluble substances are able to cross easily. In order to understand elevated intracranial pressure, we refer to the Monroe-Kelly Doctrine. The idea that the cranial compartment, the skull, is incompressible, so the volume inside it has to be fixed. The cranium contains three things, blood, CSF, and brain tissue. If the volume of any one constituent increases, the volume of another one has to decrease or else pressure will increase. So when we look at patients with increased intracranial pressure, it's probably due to an increase in one of these three components. Blood, so that could be due to hypertension, cerebral vasodilation leading to increased cerebral blood flow, hypervolemia, increased CVP or hemorrhage. When patients cough against a closed glottis, so an extubated patient, let's say, or when they buck against the ventilator, this increases ICP by increasing MAP and CVP. Increased CSF can be due to increased production or impaired drainage, and then increased brain tissue could be due to cerebral edema or tumor. Signs and symptoms of increased intracranial pressure include headache, nausea and vomiting, papilledema, consci decreased consciousness leading to coma. Acutely increased intracranial pressure is not tolerated very well. Chronic increased cranial, intracranial pressure may have much more subtle symptoms until it becomes very elevated. If ICP becomes very high, there may be what's called midline shift of brain contents, where we see structures moving from one side to the other and the brain becomes not symmetric. The worst outcome is herniation, 
where brain contents move over various meningeal barriers. And this can be life-threatening because usually those parts of the brain that herniate do not get adequate blood supply. Some examples shown here are uncal herniation, where it's herniating over the uncus, central herniation, where we can see midline structures moving across the midline, cingulate herniation at the top of the brain, transcalvarier herniation when there is uh, damage to the skull and herniation out through the hole, upward herniation where we see midbrain and, and brainstem structures herniating up, and tonsillar herniation where we see brainstem herniating down through the foramen magnum. If a patient has elevated intracranial pressure and you do a lumbar puncture, it could lead to tonsillar herniation as we relieve pressure down here and the brain moves towards that lower pressure area. For that reason, patients who present um, to the emergency room often aren't given a lumbar puncture if, until we've ruled out the presence of an intracranial bleed. There are many, many treatments for intracranial pressure. They generally focus on addressing one of these three causes, blood, CSF, or brain. We can elevate the head. We can control blood pressure. Hyperventilation will decrease CO2 and decrease cerebral blood flow. Placement of a CSF drain in the head or in the lumbar spine. Hyperosmotic drugs like mannitol or hypertonic saline will shrink brain cells. Diuretics, like loop diuretics, will decrease volume status. Corticosteroids like dexamethasone will shrink brain tissue. Cerebral vasoconstrictors like propofol or barbiturate. Surgical decompression will open the calvarium, open the skull, and allow expansion of brain contents. Deepening, surgical anest deepening anesthesia will decrease cerebral metabolic oxygen rate. Neuromuscular blockade can be helpful. And ensuring that the that there's proper venous drainage from the brain. So that means avoiding extreme flexion or extension of the neck. That's it for this section. Please do let me know if you have questions about any of the material.